Hello, welcome to Convocation today. We apologize for the delay in getting started. We had some technical problems. Um, thanks to Chris Coletta from the Eccles Center staff for getting us switched over. Um, we're really honored today to have Eileen Hallett Stone with us. And we're thankful for Zoom that makes this possible. Um, between COVID and the snowstorm, it was gonna be hard to do this in person today. Um, Normally I have some announcements. I would just encourage all the students to check your email with for the course announcements, but I'm going to just uh, introduce our, our speaker and turn the time over to her. So we're, we're again, we're honored to host you today. Um, transplanted from New England, Utah-based writer and former Salt Lake Tribune living history columnist, Eileen Hallett Stone is the author of five books that address issues of equity, community, and ethnic histories. Her collected stories in a homeland in the West, Utah Jews Remember, was developed into a photo documentary exhibit uh, for the 2002 Winter Olympics as part of the Cultural Olympiad. And I would just note that we had Larry Sespooch presenting last week, who was also deeply involved in those Olympics and we're appreciative that the Olympics are still paying such great dividends these years later. Her commentaries have been featured in documentary films for KUED and the National Center for Jewish Film. She's currently teaching for the University of Utah's Osher classes and working on a new book. Today's talk will address Utah's Holocaust survivors and their experiences. And so if you can join with me in uh, giving Eileen Hallett Stone a round of applause. Yay, yay, yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Allred, for having me here, and hello to Snow College. I was there several years ago. It's a beautiful place, and it looks even bigger than I ever imagined. Um, but time is limited, so I'm going to begin doing this. I'd like to start with when Hitler rose in power as a leader of the Nazi party and became president of Germany in 1934, the director overthrew the Constitution he abolished women's human rights. He blamed Jews for the country's failing economy. In a state, in a state sponsored wide ranging anti Semitic scourge fueled by sadistic and pathological hatred, he initiated Nazi Germany and its collaborators to implement a savage campaign resulting in the systematic degradation, persecution, and annihilation of Jews and others deemed undesirable or subhuman to fit in German society. They created the Holocaust, the largest and most tragic disaster mankind ever experienced in the 20th century. So who were these undesirables? Well, they're people like you and they're people like me. Anyone who is different, they didn't believe fit in their German society, was at risk. Inspiring hatred was and is relatively easy, especially when it's unrelenting, repetitive, and feeds directly on people's fears and biases. By 1934, thousands of anti-Semitic Graphics, political cartoons, flyers, and posters were plastered on walls, windows, in parks, and on streets. Newspapers and radios were strident with anti-Semitic diatribes. In the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, the Jews were dis um, disenfranchised. They were no longer considered citizens. They were non-citizens, and they were enemies of the people. In early 1938, laws and decrees and restrictions tumbled onto one onto the other to shatter the Jewish economic existence in Germany. And that was only the beginning. From 1933 to 1945, the Holocaust Museum estimates six million Jews and five million non-Jews were murdered, starved, worked to death, medically experiment, experimented on and died in many of the death camps, concentration camps, labor camps, sub camps, and ghetto prisons built in Nazi occupied countries. This is just the Dachau sub camps. 
Thankfully, there were survivors, those who survived the camps, those who were able to escape, those who hid, those who were taken in for refuge. And there were the righteous Gentiles, the non-Jews, who risked their lives to help save the neighboring Jews when all around them, hostility and indifference prevailed. The Holocaust is etched in the memory of those who survived. They are aging, their numbers are dwindling, but the legacy of their stories is clear. We must never forget. We can never forget. I am grateful to the fine Jewish women and men who interviewed with me in Utah. Their stories are long. The following are gently edited excerpts. Forced labor, lost youth, forced labor, lost youth, Michael Schaefer. <clears throat> I interviewed him in 2000. Born and raised under Polish-German borders, 12-year-old Michael Schaefer saw his grandparents herded into a truck and taken away by the Nazis. A year later, he was picked up by the SS and spent his youth, five and a half years, in forced labor camps. He said, I was in six camps somewhere in Eastern Germany and they were starving us. I was a young boy. I lost everyone, everyone, and I read all the time. Believing that God was watching me gave me strength. But when I saw and I heard about the atrocities in the camps that people committed against other people, I couldn't reconcile it with my beliefs. I grew up with a Jewish God. It could have been a Christian God, a Muslim God. How could he have allowed this to happen? Michael did manual labor. He carried pipes, he dug holes, worked in a quarry and in a chemical plant. Separated from the German civilian workers who got paid for their labor, he said they would see us working, but they could not, would not talk to us. A loving child, sweet in nature, idealistic, and at one time happy, he now hated Germans. <clears throat> Excuse me. To me, everyone was a murderer. Losing strength every day and worrying that he would be killed if he didn't work. He said a German man working for the Nazis saved his life. He was a tall German, he said, a professional distinguished in his dress, a civilian who wore a Nazi party emblem on his lapel, but he was not a guard. We never talked, he said. We were not allowed to. But I survived because of this man, this man who represents all that I hated, saved my life. Every day, he came over to my side where I was working, and he dropped a sandwich by my feet. I couldn't make sense of it. He did this day in and day out. Whenever I worked, and I wanted to work because he was keeping me alive. Although we never made eye contact, I could see that he looked around to make sure he was not observed by a guard, that he would not be caught doing what he was doing. If he had been seen helping a Jew, he could have been killed. Actually, he would have been killed. I don't know his name. I know nothing about him, and I cannot explain why he did this for me, why he took such a risk. A man I thought was my enemy, a man whose name I do not know, saved my life. By the time Michael was liberated, he was 18 and a half years old, with no family to go home to, no home to go home to, no schooling, and he had to begin all over again. And yet by 1948, Michael spoke seven languages. He was guided by a Red Cross woman, a Quaker, and he was taught by unemployed German and Latvian teachers who wrote his textbooks from scratch, passed his high school exams, and without stepping a foot inside a public school. And then he was admitted to medical school in Germany. 
how he must have felt being the only Jew in this big auditorium because he did get his degree and he became a pediatrician. What pediatrician? Why? I had no model, he told me. Although as a child, I was impressed when I was about 10 years old, my grandmother was sick. My grandfather called in what was known as a healer. And I was surprised by the impact this man had on my grandparents. I realized this is what I want to do. I want to do good for people. I had nothing else to go on. I wanted to help people. Youth and luck, necessities for survival, Abe Katz. In 1937, Abe Katz was a husky 14 year old living with his family in the city of Lutz in central Poland. His father peddled fruit from sacks strung over his shoulder. His mother went door to door doling out fresh milk from a cup. Abe loved soccer. He liked girls. He hated potatoes. His mother made him noodles from scratch. I was her only son and very close to her, he said. When the Nazis occupied the city, Abe was pulled out of school, stigmatized with the yellow star of David identification badge and forced to make horse saddles for the German army. Hugging his mother goodbye one morning, he walked toward the factory, never got there and never ever got home. I know I broke her heart, he said, but the Gestapo picked me up right on the street. Assigned to clean soldiers' billets, Abe slept in an empty warehouse until he was relocated to Auschwitz, where he was stripped of his clothes, tattooed with the number B6282, handed prison guard, and put to work. At first he dug dishes, ditches, then he cut wood in the forest to make a big fire. That's when they brought in the gypsies, he said. They pushed him into the fire and said we had to watch. We would be next. At night, the pet prisoners slept on bare wooden planks, bunks. Five people to a tier, pressed tightly against one another and facing the same direction. Every hour or so, a whistle sounded, a light went on, and we turned from one side to the other, skin and bones. By morning, some souls never got up. When Abe was transported to the notoriously brutal central labor camp, yours know, he worked in the coal mines and attributed his survival to youth and luck. These are all the suitcases that when prisoners arrived at a concentration camp, thinking they were going somewhere else. This is what was left of them, many, their suitcases. For nearly two years, Abe said they fed us just enough to keep us working. In the mornings, we'd walk four kilometers, two and a half miles, I think, to the railroad car that took us closer to the mines. We worked with Polish civilian miners, hoping one would offer us food. When a kind person did, Oh, we tried to be assigned to them. Abe's task was to build a narrow gauge track used to transport the coal cars. One day, they drilled four holes in the spike and put dynamite into each one to blast the area. I was on my knees pounding the spikes when they started drilling. Two extra more holes. All of a sudden, the movement set off the charges and the walls came tumbling down. One post splintered and fell on Abe, knocking him onto the rails, slicing his hand. And yet unable to flush it clean with water, he worked four more hours before marching back to the railroad car and then walking to the labor camp. And by nightfall, he had a soaring temperature. His hand was infected and swollen. I was always in a state of unease, he told me. I mean, if somebody wanted to take you out, they could. But I never thought about dying or about women or my old life or school. I thought only about surviving another day. This time was different. I didn't think I'd make it. I didn't even care. 
Finding a piece of tin and heating it over a little fire, several prisoners held Abe down, cut sharply into his hand, and drained the infection. They saved my life, he said, and as luck would have it, an older guard let him sleep. A week later, weighing 84 pounds, Abe returned to the filthy, unsafe, claustrophobic mine. We were so thin, Abe said. Every morning we'd stand outside in a line and shed our pants. A uniformed doctor carrying a little stick would look at your body and point one way or the other. One way you knew you were finished. The other you would survive to work another day. Excuse me. <laughs> Working in the mines, Abe never thought about escaping. Where could you go? There was only one tunnel in and one way out. The mine work, the prisoners were rationed boots. Our prison shoes were useless, he said. Thick wooden soles with a cloth cover nailed to the wood. We'd slide rather than walk. Marching in snow, rain or mud, the material would get soaked through and fall apart. We'd tear strips of material from whatever we had to tie around the entire wood again and again, kept fixing our shoes so we could keep walking. When the Nazi soldiers forced marched the Jewish prisoners from Oznow, Oznow to an uncertain destination, Abe said 19-year-old soldiers, punks they were, would come from behind and yell and poke at you with, your, with their rifles. If you didn't move, you were done. Abe remembered a waterway and being herded into an open barge. The breeze was cold and frigid, he said, but it was so much better than walking. I don't know how long we traveled, but we disembarked. We walked, marched through one village and then another village and then another village and onto a cattle train. And a month later, Abe walked the last five miles into a massive concentration camp, Buchenwald. His inmate, his inmate number was 126,000, 126,000. It was one of the largest ones. And he was given an empty can. It was our lifeline, that, that empty can, he said. If you didn't have one, you couldn't get any food. Punching two holes into the coffee-sized tin, he threaded a piece of string through it and tied it to his waist. Wherever you went, you needed your can to stay alive. He also blended into his surroundings. I laid low. I never volunteered. I pretended I'm not here. When the news spread that the Allied forces were advancing, Nazi soldiers started evacuating the prisoners. There were rumors that the camp was mined. Prisoners were lined up daily. We didn't know where we'd be taken or if we'd be shot. Amid the bombings and the fear of extermination, Abe disappeared into a sewer with four other inmates. At daybreak, a Jewish guard called a capo, C-A-P-O, would open the sewer plate. We climbed down the mental ru metal rungs, he said, into the foul water, and we'd stay there all day. At night, he'd open the plate, and we'd go out and sneak back into the barracks. Day after day, we did it terrified. On April 11th, 1945, General George S. Patton's U.S. Third Army, Sixth Armored Division, arrived to li liberate Buchenwald. When the lid opened, 22-year-old Abe emerged, emaciated, filthy, and free. 20-year-old. Nothing above a whisper, Herman Spiegel's interview. I've interviewed him several times in the last decade, and he was going to teach me about watchmaking, and, and then he died. But he had such a story to tell. In 1938, on the outskirts of the most populous city of Kolomia, in what was then in Poland, five-year-old Herman Spiegel loved life. He loved fishing for carp, camping with family, including Hilda, Jacob, and Lunia, who was born deaf. And in the winters, he loved to chip ice to draw water from the well. Herman's parents 
Moisha, Moses, and Sally were into agriculture. They owned land that was leased out to Ukrainian farmers. They had a large home and a warehouse, and they ran a thriving general store and tavern. My father spoke several languages and had many German, Polish, and Russian friends, he said. <coughs> Hardworking and opinionated, he also shared the only radio in the village. He didn't think Hitler would amount to anything. And he was wrong. In March 1942, <coughs> excuse me. Colomia's ghetto was reassembled into three block-long boroughs of apartments surrounded by barbed wire, flanked by guards. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm fine. I just have a little bit of a throat. In 1942, Colomia's ghetto was reassembled into three block-long boroughs of apartments surrounded by barbed wire, flanked by guards and walled off from the rest of the now Aryan city. Streams of bewildered and frightened Jews were deported into the congested ghetto, some 3,000 already destined for extermination. Normalcy was impossible, but Moses made plans to keep his family safe. A non-Jewish German friend and the town's mayor recruited to work to, with the Nazis, but was never a Nazi, gave work papers to Moses so that he could leave the ghetto to collect feathers and down for the German army and hopefully return with food. A Ukrainian friend stored some of the belong, their belongings. A Polish woman promised to hide loaves of bread. <coughs> I even took a cough medicine. Polish woman promised to hide loads of bread, and Moses stowed money, legal papers, some valuables, and his wife's fur coat. You would think, why would he do that? Well, he did it because he knew he needed money to actually survive this time of hiding, of being, of being Jewish, of maybe not making it. Perfect. When the, trucks, when the trucks went to evacuate the Jews from their homes, the Spiegels walked into the ghetto, wearing everything they could and carrying everything they had. Moses found a room cluttered with old broken furniture and a concealed storage space in the bottom floor behind a small house. He used his papers to pass through the sentry, found food left by his dear friends, and returned to a family often too terrified to light a candle. Police raids occurred often during the Jewish holidays and almost always in the dark, Herman said. We escaped the first one by hiding in the small room. We had to be quiet and it was very small, but we had to sit or stand still for hours. Luckily, the police didn't know we were there, but a thousand other Jews disappeared that day. Come September, 8,700 more had. A surprise raid and a random wild shot took the life of Lunia. I saw blood coming from her, from her ear. I saw blood coming from her ear, Herman said. Mother was numb with sorrow. She never stopped grieving and she never did stop grieving. When the SS burned one ghetto down, blocked down to the ground, they shot Jews trying to escape. In the closing of the second ghetto, 4,500 more Jews were transported by cattle cars to concentration camps. And it was a, during a raid that hidden in the earthen basement with a group of others, Moses tried to convince them to leave, but they were devastated. And they were so victimized, they couldn't understand what could they do to save their life. They couldn't move, but Moses knew there was no other place to go but out. And wearing all the clothes they had on a cold, moonless night, Moses guided his family through an opening in a wire fence and disappeared into a great field. They hid in many places for brief respites, but sometimes old friends turned out to be anything but. 
One farmer offered his barn to Moses if Moses would return later in the evening with his wife's fur coat. Moses sensed betrayal. It was strange to look at this farmer, but he said he would. <clears throat> he left him with the family safely somewhere in the fields. He returned alone without the coat and keeping out of sight, he saw a familiar Gestapo driven black car stopped by the farm and men get out and boy, he left. He paid one farmer with a gated acreage to stay in an unattached barn near the forest. Spending an uneasy 11 months in a loft behind bales of hay took its toll. Hygiene was near impossible. Medicine was unavailable. Moses and Jacob, the older son, risked discovery seeking food in nearby villages and sometimes out of sight would help out a farmer they knew in the fields. But this farmer wanted more until neighbors became suspicious of him seeing this man wearing great clothes and new boots while his wife was still in rags, work clothes. To dispel rumors of hoarding Jews for money, the farmer opened his gate. The Spiegels would flee for safety until the last time the farmer, who could no longer get any money from them, evicted them with threats and brutality. The final refuge was in the park belonging to his friend, the mayor, who had given him work papers. A devoted Catholic, the righteous man wanted to help, but he was terrified about putting his wife and children in jeopardy. Nazi officers had taken over his home as an office, he said. But he said, if I send you away, I will never see you again. We hid in this man's, this kind man's barn for five months, Herman said. Caution to never speak above a whisper or let their presence be known. Herman snapped lice in between his fingers. Hilda, who was a teenager, worked out silently. They read whatever they could get their hands on. Moses and Jacob scrambled for food and peering through small cracks in the barn, Herman saw Nazi officers <clears throat> come and go, but no one ever saw him. In 1944, a year before the fall of the Third Reich, the Spiegels were liberated courtesy of the Soviet Red Army. It took months for the eight-year-old Herman to speak above a whisper. In fact, even when we talked and had a bagel and coffee at Barnes and Noble in Sugar House, and he was an older man by then, he still spoke so quietly and carefully and cautiously. <clears throat> this is John Price. I've interviewed him over the years as well. And he's a, his memory is incredible. My father, he said, had a citywide block of stores in Spandau with a courtyard in the middle, shops on the first floor, living areas on the second, and a design that was like the predecessor of an early shopping mall, said Salt Lake developer, businessman, and former U.S. ambassador, John Price. The district in Spandau was mainly Jewish, Professional people, doctors, lawyers, teachers, lots of artists, performing artists, musicians, and there were beautiful parks, just beautiful parks. Born in 1933, John and his brother Wolfgang lived with their family above the store. He said it was a normal life, a good life. He went to public school, snuck into his father's movie theater with friends. The films were very primitive at the time, he said. He devoured pastries and was only mildly perplexed when one parent or the other accompanied him the two blocks from home to Hebrew school. My father, Selman Price, which was changed to Simon Price in America, was a Teutonic type of guy, he said, very strong, a doer. He served in the German army in World War I and was awarded a, a medal, but he wasn't much of a speaker. When Hitler rose to power, my father wouldn't think to talk about what was happening, or maybe 
he didn't want us to worry. There were early signs that Jews were in danger and talk of people getting out of Germany, he said. I had aunts, uncles, and cousins all living nearby or on the block of our home. Some had gone on trips and disappeared. Years earlier in the 20s, people tried to convince my father to sell his business and go to America. He had helped two brothers immigrate, but he didn't want to believe. He believed he had no reason to go away and that Hitler would be voted out. And it didn't work that way. In April 1938, Jews were required to register their property. In July, a law was passed forbidding Jews to work in real estate. And after the November 9th, 1938 program, known as Kristallnacht, a ban was placed on all Jewish activities. Kristallnacht was called the night of broken glass. In Germany and Austria, Nazi stormtroopers, militia, and members of the Hitler Youth unleashed a wave of violent anti-Jewish pogroms, which means riots, called Kristallnacht throughout Germany, annexed Austria and areas of German-occupied Czechoslovakia. They beat, killed, and imprisoned hundreds of Jews, more than 30,000. 30, more than 30,000 were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Some 200 synagogues were vandalized and burned. Hundreds of Torahs, the five books of the Hebrew Bible, were desecrated. Spandau's great grand 296 seat synagogue, built in 1895, was reduced to rubble. Carrying bats, crowds stormed into one Jewish owned store after another, including the prices. They smashed storefronts, they looted merchandise, and marked display cases and broken goods with glaring yellow stars of David. And yet people walked by and looked. They looked. What did they do? They didn't. I remember we were in our apartment and the sounds were frightening, John recalled. My mother, Margaret, closed the curtains and turned off the lights. My father covered our heads and prayed we hid quietly like we didn't exist. Unfortunately, they didn't have ladders. <clears throat> In the aftermath, Margaret swept up the shattered glass. Simon boarded the broken shop windows. Applying for compensation, he was forced instead to pay a fine for the destruction. Economic restrictions and the ensuing boycott on Jewish businesses sounded the death rattle. <clears throat> Soon, every Jew was required to wear a yellow star sewn to their outer clothing and carry identity cards with Big J for Jew emblazoned on the front and on all passports. Adding to their name was a generic Israel for males and Sarah for females. In some places, it was believed that a Jewish woman could be identified by an exposed ear, so they had to tuck their hair behind just tuck their hair behind their ear. I don't know about a Jewish ear. Father recognized the situation was crucial. Although he loved his country, he knew the plight of the Jews would get worse. And in secrecy, with the help of a compassionate, non-Jewish couple, planned their escape. John said, I don't know what happened to this couple, but we went into hiding and they helped us until we could really get out. One morning, father told us to pack for a day trip. Margaret removed the identifying yellow stars from their clothing. The following morning, Simon concealed a cache of family valuables to be sold as needed. Carrying little suitcases, the normal family boarded a train for the seaport city of Bremerhaven. And one of the last freighters, a banana boat, was waiting to take them to freedom. They were afraid until they finally actually went to Panama first, and then they finally came to America. <clears throat> when the world changed, Lysel Scheinberg, I absolutely love this woman. I, I met her just through phone conversations and then in person. And um, 
she had so much to say and she was writing about it. And she died probably three weeks ago in Ogden where she was, was living with her family. She was, I think, 92 years old. <clears throat> but in 1928, Liesl Scheinberg was born in her family's ancestral home of Aachen, Germany. Her father, Max Stern, owned a textile factory. Although his wife, Anna, died during the 1928 influenza epidemic shortly after giving birth, Stern's second wife, Mina, became a devoted mother. She didn't become a devoted mother. She was a devoted mother to Liesl and her older sister, Lottie. The Stearns lived in a fashionable household that thrived in extended family relationships and emphasized courtesy and correctness, coupled with the exercise, healthy foods, and fresh air. Five-year-old Liesl was a happy and curious child. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, her world began to change. A bright student, Liesl attended kindergarten at Montessori School before being enrolled in a Jewish primary school. Crossing a main square, she was forced to dodge volleys of spoiled fruit thrown by Aryan youth. In school, she was often called upon to read by government officials investigating Jewish schools for subversive teaching. They would hand me a book with marked pages, usually with lines about bad Jews, she said. It was frightening. I was afraid to make any errors. And when the strangers left, I'd hurry to the bathroom. In 1937, many parks were restricted to Jews. And when they were there, they could only sit on the yellow benches. There were signs everywhere. In 1938, 10-year-old Scheinberg entered the fifth grade of Victoria School. The teachers wore brown uniforms branded with Nazi emblems. Days after Kristallnacht, Liesl was late for class. Racing up the metal stairs, she ran into a Nazi party teacher. He grabbed my arm and slapped me so hard across the face, I fell backward down the stairwell. I heard his boots clatter, and I tried to get up and away from him, but he grabbed me again, struck my hand, struck me, struck me in the face hard and ordered me to go home. Lysol left, tears checked, there was no going back. Walking rapidly to circumvent the nearby plaza and avoid the crowds, Lysol passed a kiosk where a hanging poster depicted a caricature of a Jewish man as humpbacked and lecherous with oversized teeth and a rat-like face. She heard a customer say Jews like him would be taken care of soon. Turning onto their street, she saw her stepmother pacing on the apartment's second floor balcony. Minna had heard rumors and was worried about her husband, Max's safety. Already distraught, she was stunned by the sight of Lysol, shivering with skin bruised, black and blue. She put her arms around me and pulled me inside. Then the doorbell rang and it was daddy, pale but smiling and hugging us tightly. <clears throat> While working at the textile factory that morning, Stern and several other Jews were arrested, herded into a synagogue, and forced to collect the temple's valuables for the Third Reich. Windows were smashed, religious books burned, the men were beaten and humiliated, and the synagogue was set on fire, trapping those Max inside. Fortunately, the terrified men escaped through a small side door and Stern was grateful to be home. I knew the word concentration camp, and I cried, are they coming after us? The thought that I might be included was beginning to connect in my young mind. From then on, mother and I stayed mostly indoor. My sister Lottie was in school in Berlin, and my father could no longer ignore what was happening. One night after celebrating <clears throat> Hanukkah early, Lysel's parents quickly packed her clothes, and a new wooden flute, a gift in an overnight case. When a stranger's car appeared outside the building, they placed their daughter in the back seat with her cousin, Verna Gantz, kissing her goodbye, and she had no idea where she was going. They watched as the driver sped away to Amsterdam. Do I still have time? 
Are you okay? <clears throat> when the, with the two children given temporary <clears throat> Dutch status and taken to the Amsterdam apartment of Max's sister, Frieda Rice, the Stearns concentrated on Lottie. <clears throat> Lottie was a strong-willed, independent young woman attending art school in Berlin, 335 miles from home. The 17-year-old carried a false birth certificate stating she was Catholic. She was also extremely deaf, which was a liability. The Holocaust Museum confirmed more than 275,000 adults and children deemed unworthy of life by the Nazis were murdered because of their disabilities. <clears throat> Unable to hear the November pogrom, she saw and lip read Hitler youth thugs wearing civilian clothes, ransacking stores, painting anti Semitic slogans, and screaming, Jude, Jude, Jude. She returned to her home, and when she felt safe enough, she walked to the railroad station, bought a secondhand class ticket to Aachen, and sat at the window seat for the train to depart. She felt someone plunk down next to her an army officer, a Nazi army officer in full uniform, who chatted looking directly at her. <clears throat> she read his lips and nodded and she smiled, but she never said a word. And when he got off the train, she slumped in relief. Reunited with her family, they had 12 hours to leave their house or be arrested. They were required to relinquish their valuables to the Third Reich hand over the family business and walk to the border, which is what they did. They carried two suitcases each. And they made it to the Dutch border where they were examined, identified as Jews, allowed in and taken to an abandoned army post in The Hague. Lysel impatiently waited for months to see her parents, I will never forget, she told me. My parents and Lottie were standing behind a barbed wire fence waiting for me. Mother was thin and harried looking, yet with everything that had been lost, she managed to carry a piece of my past, a favorite doll. Out of detention, the stern settled into their own apartment. Out of the blue, an anonymous tiny box, an anonymous tiny box held together by rubber bands mysteriously arrived at their door. Inside were several pieces of Minna's jewelry, followed by a call of good news from Max's brother, Newton. And the next thing they do, they were on board the SS Volundum and they sailed to America, to a world Lysel knew would change again, but this time for the better. Missing her parents dearly. This is a postscript. She was surprised by this. She finally picked up the flute that she had been given and she tried to play music and she couldn't. Finally, frustrated, she went inside, opened the flute and inside the flute was a slender tube filled with diamonds and a note from her parents, in case of emergency, sell the diamonds. We hope to see you soon, but the future is uncertain. And we love you. That's it. Do you want to say a picture of one more? I think you can find one. I think we're done. That's that's Lysol. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that's Lysol on the right. Oh. So I get. I think we're I done. So appreciate okay? this. Okay, I understand that some of you need to go to class. Um, thank you for being here. Let's give uh, Eileen Hallett-Stone another round of applause for sharing these stories with us. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I coughed, I have a cold, but I'm healthy. <laughs> I'm glad, and it was, Perfectly fine. Was it okay? Yes, it was.